God gave Jesus the authority over his church. You know how I interpret that? Jesus Christ is the senior pastor of Redeemer Church. John 3.16 lets us know that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for us. He's given everyone a gift, all of humanity, and set it in their lap. Now, unfortunately, there are many of us who never unwrap the gift. Are there any areas of your life where you are not letting Christ rule? Now, notice, I didn't say letting Christ in, because you can invite Christ in, but not let him rule. He can be your Savior, but not your Lord. Are you with me right now? Seek to understand rather than being understood. Don't raise your voice. Don't call names. Don't be mean to someone's face, behind their back, behind your keyboard, or on your smartphone. It's only through Christ that we can be empowered to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received. He empowers us to be the people that God has created us to be. Good morning again, everybody. It is good to be with you in the presence of the Lord today, and hello to everybody worshiping from many different locations or watching later on this week on demand. I hope you have enjoyed and been challenged by this series in Ephesians. So as you turn to chapter 6, where we will focus today, let me recap again. Chapter 1, we looked at Paul's prayer for the church for hope for our glorious inheritance in Christ Jesus, for the power of God to be present in our lives. In chapter 2, Dave examined the essence of the gospel, that we were dead in our sin, and dead means dead, but it is Christ who made us alive. In chapter 3, I walked us through another one of Paul's prayers for the church and the petitions within, that God would strengthen you with power in your inner being, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you may know the love of Christ which surpasses our knowledge and that you may be filled to the full measure of God. And in chapter 4, I spent most of my sermon uh, teaching on verses 2 and 3, the prerequisites for unity in the church, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, in the bond of peace, And last week in chapter 5, Dave offered what uh, I believe was one of the best explanations of mutual submission in marriage, at least one of the best that I've ever heard. So if you've missed any of these weeks, please go online and catch up by watching the archives. What I'm going to do to begin is read from the amplified version of Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse 10. And amplified means amplified. Um, This is going to be a lengthy reading, Um, so I I also want you to know I think this is probably going to be the finest portion of my sermon today, because I'm just reading the amplified version of the text, so if you step out to get more coffee in the next five minutes, we're going to judge you. Verse 10, in conclusion, if you need to go to the restroom, that's different than getting coffee. We won't judge you, but don't, don't leave. This is the word. In conclusion... Be strong in the Lord, draw your strength from him, and be empowered through your union with him. And in the power of his boundless might, put on the full armor of God, for his precepts are like the splendid armor of a heavily armed soldier, so that you may may be able to successfully stand up against all the schemes and the strategies and the deceits of the devil." For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural places. Therefore, put on the complete armor of God so that you will be able to successfully resist And stand your ground in the evil day of danger. And having done everything that the crisis demands, to stand firm in your place, fully prepared, immovable, victorious. So stand firm and hold your ground 
having tightened the wide band of truth, personal integrity, and moral courage around your waist, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, an upright heart, and having strapped on your feet the gospel of peace in preparation to face the enemy with firm-footed stability and the readiness produced by the good news. Above all, lift up the protective shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray with specific requests at all times, on every occasion and in every season, in the spirit and with this in view. Stay alert with all perseverance and petition, interceding in prayer for all God's people. Amen. From the NIV, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. I have a question for you. How powerful do you believe God is? How powerful do you believe God is? Not how powerful you were taught by your grandmother that God is. Not how powerful you heard in third grade VBS how powerful God is. How powerful do you think God is? Because we are in a spiritual battle. And if you're going out into this battle ground and you lack confidence in how powerful your general is, then you are seriously disadvantaged. This is a battlefield. And how powerful do you believe your general, Jesus Christ, is? It is good for us to be reminded by God's word how powerful God is. Maybe you remember Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1 that I taught on five weeks ago. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know this incomparably great power for us who believe. The power that is like the working of his mighty strength, which, listen, the power that he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule, far above all authority, far above all power and dominion and every title that can be given, not only in this present age, but in the age to come as well. And God placed all things under his feet and elevated Jesus Christ to be the authority of the church. That's the kind of power that we're talking about and reading about in scripture. So for any of you Greek geeks, we're going to go on a quick Greek detour, a Greek tour, if you will, to help further explain this point. Power in Ephesians 1.19 is dunamis or dunameos. And maybe when I say that and you see it on screen, maybe you see and hear the word dynamite. This is where we get our word dynamite. God exerted his power that we just read in Ephesians 1.20, with which he raised Christ from the dead, is energeo, or energeken, which maybe you hear and maybe you see our word, what? Energy. And power in Ephesians 6.10, where we're camping out today, is iskus, meaning power, meaning might, and meaning forcefulness. So I don't know what you think about when you hear the word power. I think about a jet engine. I think about the jaws of a lion. And I think about these uh, really large men in really tight tank tops that tear phone books in half. You've seen these guys. And that is, in fact, power. That's very powerful. The power of God, though, if you take the original language, is a mighty, energetic, active, dynamic force that is unparalleled and unrivaled. There's nothing like it. The power of God is a mighty, energetic, active, dynamic force that is unparalleled and unrivaled. And then Paul writes, finally, be strong in the Lord. And I looked at this word, loipu, 
finally in the Greek, and it doesn't mean, Paul, like you would finish a letter. Finally, because I'm done writing you this letter, be strong in the Lord. It's actually this implication of from now on. It's attached to time. From now on, for the remainder of your days, be strong in the Lord and in his power. Not just being strong in the Lord in your trials, not just being strong in the Lord in your temptations, not just being strong in the Lord on the very worst days of your life where you shoot a flare to heaven and hope God hears you, but it's being strong in the power of God every day of your life. Be strong. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, which is today, when you read this, when the day of evil comes, you're living in it. When the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Paul reminds us here that our struggle is cosmic in scope, and that this battle is not against flesh and blood. Now listen, I'm going to confess to you that this is hard to remember, because when my feelings are hurt, or when I get into an emotional disagreement with someone, what do I think that this battle's all about? The relational, the emotional, right? Drive back to the spiritual here. Paul is saying your battle as a Christ follower does not come down to flesh and blood. It's not about winning every argument in this life. The finish line is not here on earth. You don't have to win all the time relationally. You don't have to go home every day feeling good about yourself emotionally. You need to be reminded by God's word today that this is spiritual. Let, te let the text draw you back into the spiritual. It's not against flesh and blood. And he lists these many classes of evil spirits, rulers, authorities, powers of darkness, spiritual forces of evil. The whole universe is a battleground. And as if contending with the attacks of men, which I know I just mentioned emotional battles, we've all been hurt by others, as if that's not enough, we also must contend with the attacks of these spiritual forces that are in opposition to God. And as soon as you take on the title, son of God or daughter of God, as soon as you love your spouse with the love of Christ, as soon as you love your neighbor, as soon as you say yes to a ministry assignment, as soon as you share the gospel with someone else, guess what happens? Now the spiritual battle is against you because you are a representative of God. So it's cosmic in scope, but it's also a battle against you. Just Thursday morning, I was down the street with one of my mentors having coffee. He's turning 62 years old soon. And he shared with me that he's never been this restless. He's never lost this much sleep physically over the course of his life because he lays in bed in agony over the fact that the church is asleep. Do I have anybody's attention today? He is in spiritual agony because he says the church today is sleeping. So comfortable. So complacent. So casual about the fact that we are at war, that he's physically lo losing sleep over the sleeping church. You are in a spiritual war, and a spiritual war requires spiritual weapons. I'm going to say that a second time in case you're not listening. You're in a spiritual war, and a spiritual war requires spiritual weapons. I'm going to say it a third time for those of you that really struggle to pay attention. You're in a spiritual war, and this spiritual war requires spiritual weapons. You cannot fight this war with your intellect. You cannot fight this war with your uh, academic achievements or your education. You cannot fight this war with your 
very impressive resume. You cannot fight this war with your wealth. You can fight this war next to your spouse or next to your brothers and sisters in Christ, but your spouse and your brothers and sisters in Christ are not called to fight this war for you. They're called to fight this war with you, next to you, in unity with you, but you've got to fight this war yourself with God's help, with the Holy Spirit, with the armor of God. It's about you, cosmic in scale, but on an individual basis. And if you don't know you're in a war, then hear the words of my mentor, wake up. Wake up. Sorry if you came to Redeemer Church today to feel good. Paul is insisting that when you put on this armor and it is fully applied, see, he says over and over again, put on the what? Armor? No. The full armor, not partial. When the full armor is applied, we are able to stand firm when we are under attack. This is consistent throughout the New Testament. The one who is in you, Jesus, is greater than the one, Satan, who is in the world, 1 John 4. Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will what? He will, he's going to run, he's going to flee, right? When you're submitted to God, when you put on the armor of God, when you preach God's word to this spiritual darkness, our enemy flees, he's a sissy. Your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, though, and stand firm in the faith, 1 Peter 5. So let's look in more detail at this armor. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth, buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of, of the spirit, which is the word of God. The belt of truth. A belt would have held a Roman soldier's tunic and weapons in place. And why? It allowed mobility. It allowed them to move freely and quickly. And the same can be said of us. We can move freely and quickly in this spiritual battle because we know the truth. In this imagery, we can depend on truth to hold every other virtue in our life in place. And we have to do our part to guard and preserve and maintain the truth as we pass it on generation to generation. Because how many of y'all know there are many false truths being preached today? I preached a sermon a few weeks ago titled, I think we called it false doctrine or something. So, you know, maybe that's intriguing to some. I gave 15 red flags that you can look out for as you listen to God's word and discern whether or not you're hearing truth or false doctrine. Please go listen to that sermon if you missed it. Um, number two, breastplate of righteousness is mentioned in the same breath. I don't think it's accidental that Paul chose the imagery of the breastplate of righteousness to protect and guard the most vital parts of the body. Maybe as we yield to the righteousness of Christ rather than our own sinful desires, we are unconquerable in this battle. Maybe, just maybe. Sandals made of the gospel of peace. Military boots were one of the most important features of the Roman soldier's equipment, and they were designed for long, tiring marches through every kind of terrain. It has been said that the delicate attention given to soldiers' boots was the secret of the Roman conquest. And why? You got to protect your feet, right? I mean, I saw the NBA Finals a long time ago where Shaquille O'Neal was benched. He didn't play the whole NBA Finals. He's a massive man because he had a broken pinky toe. I tell my kids all the time, please, you're athletes, you play sports, put on shoes when you go outside and play. If you cut your foot, you stub your toe, you lose a toenail, you're not going to be able to practice and compete. Macy goes out barefoot in the sleet. I don't understand. You got to protect your feet. If you don't, you're vulnerable. So delicate attention was given to the soldier's boots. And Paul says, 
put on sandals, protect your feet with the gospel of peace. Maybe he was referring to the peace that's available for the Christian during attacks, during trials. I was reminded this week of an Asian pastor who was arrested for planting churches and spreading the gospel throughout his country. And while he was in prison, he endured some of the most horrific torture and isolation and interrogation. And he shares that God called him to fast physical food in order to give his ration of food to other prisoners who were starving and physically dying around him. He miraculously went 74 days without food. And as he did, the soldiers in this prison were asking him, why are you doing this? And in the same breath, he was able to answer with the gospel and share the gospel of Jesus with these prison guards. And after, long after he was out of prison, do you know what he wrote as a part of his testimony? He wrote that often he finds himself longing for that prison cell because it was in that place of torture and beating and isolation and hunger that he felt most near to the peace of Christ Jesus. He often longs for that place again. The shield of faith, one of the most dangerous weapons in ancient warfare was the arrow. So again, these arrows would be dipped in tar and lit on fire before they were shot across enemy lines. If you don't think that your enemy hates you, the enemy of God hates you, he's shooting arrows at you. But Paul goes on and says he's not just shooting arrows at you. He's dipping them in tar and lighting them on fire. I mean, that's how much he wants to tear you down and steal and kill and destroy. Even though the arrow may pierce the shield, the fire would be extinguished immediately and the soldier would be saved. Our shield of faith, it protects us against attacks from an invisible enemy and unexpected temptations in this life. How much faith? Just a little. Some days you may not feel like you have much faith. If you have a little, you got the shield. Hold it up. The helmet of salvation is the guarantee of ultimate deliverance no matter what happens in this battle. Would you please help me, Joshua? Is anybody here? I just said, is anybody excited about Jesus? The helmet of salvation is the guarantee of ultimate deliverance, no matter what happens in this battle. I mean, we got to be excited about this. We have been fitted and given this uniform for battle. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, living and active. It's a weapon of offense and defense, and we really have no chance in battle without it. Verse 18, and I pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Paul saves this weapon of prayer for last. The more we pray, the more alert we remain in this battle. And we're not supposed to be solely focused on praying for ourselves and our own protection in our battle with evil. But Paul is urging that a central focal point of our prayers is for the larger community of believers. Yet another way that we can walk in this theme of unity in the body of Christ that we find in Ephesians to keep one another in prayer. Now, that's the armor of God. <clears throat> I want to draw your attention to the common denominator of this armor. Jesus is the truth. Jesus alone is righteous. Jesus is the prince of peace. Jesus gives us the gift, the ability to have faith. Jesus alone is our source of salvation. Jesus is the word. He is the sword of the spirit. Do you see the common denominator in the armor? It's not the armor of Adam. It's not the armor of Emily. It's not the armor of Rob. It's, it's the armor of God. And the common denominator is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Are you with me? It's not about what we bring to the table. He provides everything. And yes, the spiritual warfare that we experience in this life 
can be frightening, but I want you to know, you don't need to fear our enemy. The war is already won. Yes, you're at battle. Yes, you're under attack. But you do not need to fear our enemy. The only thing that you might need to fear is whether or not you have the armor fully in place. Do you hear me? Don't fear the enemy and don't fear the battle. Maybe think for a second, do I have the armor of God fully in place? And if you do, no fear. It's appropriate for me to conclude this series and study on Ephesians by looking at Paul's final greetings, 6, 21 through 24. Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything so that you also may know how I am and what I'm doing. I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and sisters, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Do you remember that Paul was a prisoner in Rome? Do you ever think, how in the world did this letter get to Ephesus? I do. There was no keyboard, and there were no Wi-Fi signals. How did this letter get from Rome to Ephesus? Well, um, Paul requested a significant favor. Tychicus, will you please take this letter to the Ephesians? Can you please run this letter from Rome to Asia Minor? Now, when you consider what kind of favor this is, I, I'm going to put this in geographic perspective that maybe we can understand better than Asia Minor, especially those of you who have been to Napa in recent months. Tychicus would have boarded on a sailboat in Eureka, California. He would have sailed to Long Beach Harbor, which was a journey well over 800 miles. And after that long journey at sea, he would have walked from Long Beach Harbor to Tucson, Arizona, which is just a simple 500-mile stroll. This journey would have taken Tychicus about 45 days. And for what? Why? Why run this letter to the Ephesians? Well, Paul tells us in verse 22, I'm sending him for this very purpose. One, so that you may know how we are. But two, so that he may encourage you. So basically, a 1,300-mile journey just to check in with each other and just to encourage each other. That's how far Tychicus went. I'm curious today, how far are you willing to go to check in on the brothers and sisters in the faith in your life? How far are you willing to go before it's an inconvenience to press pause on your busyness and prioritize the spiritual health and nourishment of your sibling in the faith? How far are you willing to go? This is a staple in our denomination, this phrase that's centuries old, this question that covenanters have greeted one another with. How goes your walk? How goes your walk? You know, we get together and talk about a lot of meaningless things. You realize that? What if we sat down together and said, how goes your walk? What's going on in your life? Hey, friend, you remember we're in a spiritual battle, right? Do you have the full armor of God in place and ready to go? Remind each other. Get the armor on so that we can fight together another day in this spiritual battle. And as we fight, take heart and remember that the battles of this life will soon be over and we can taste and experience and enjoy the fact that the war has already been won. Would you stand to your feet and worship?